So today's sutta is going to be Majjhima Nikaya 109, the greater discourse on the full moon night. And we're using Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in the eastern park in the palace of Megara's mother. On that occasion, on the Iposata day of the 15th, on the full moon night, the Blessed One was seated in the open, surrounded by the Sangha of Bhikkhus. Then a certain bhikkhu rose from his seat, arranged his upper robe on one shoulder, and extending his hands in reverential salutation towards the Blessed One, said to him, Venerable Sir, I would ask the Blessed One about a certain point, if the Blessed One would grant me an answer to my question. Sit on your own seat, bhikkhu, and ask what you like. So the bhikkhu sat on his own seat and said to the Blessed One, Are these not, Venerable Sir, the five aggregates affected by clinging? That is, the material form aggregate affected by clinging, the feeling aggregate affected by clinging, the perception aggregate affected by clinging, the formations aggregate affected by clinging, and the consciousness aggregate affected by clinging. These bhikkhus are the five aggregates affected by clinging. That is the material form affected by clinging, the feeling aggregate affected by clinging, the perception aggregate affected by clinging, and the consciousness aggregate affected by clinging. Saying, Good Venerable Sir, the bhikkhu delighted and rejoiced in the Blessed One's words. Then he asked him a further question. But, Venerable Sir, in what are these five aggregates affected by clinging rooted? These five aggregates affected by clinging are rooted in desire, Bhikkhu. Venerable Sir, is that clinging the same as these five aggregates affected by clinging? Or is the clinging of something apart from the five aggregates affected by clinging? Because that clinging is neither the same as these five aggregates affected by clinging, nor is the clinging something apart from the five aggregates affected by clinging. It is the desire and lust in regard to the five aggregates affected by clinging that is the clinging there. But, Venerable Sir, can there be diversity in the desire and lust regarding these five aggregates affected by clinging. There can be, Bhikkhu, the Blessed One said. Here, Bhikkhu, someone thinks thus, may my material form be thus in the future. May my feeling be thus in the future. May my perception be thus in the future. May my formations be thus in the future. May my consciousness be thus in the future. Thus there is diversity in the desire and lust affecting these five aggregates affected by clinging. But Venerable Sir, in what way does the term aggregates apply to the aggregates? Because any kind of material form, whatever, whether past, future or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, is the material form aggregate. Any kind of feeling, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, this is the, material, this is the feeling aggregate. Any kind of perception, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, this is the perception aggregate. Any kind of formation aggregate, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, 
gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, is the formation aggregate. Any kind of consciousness, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, is the consciousness aggregate. It is in this way, Bhikkhu, that the term aggregate applies to the aggregates. What is the cause and condition, Venerable Sir, for the manifestation of the form aggregate? What is the cause and condition for the manifestation of the feeling aggregate, the perception aggregate, the formations aggregate, and the consciousness aggregate? The four great elements, Bhikkhu, are the cause and condition for the manifestation of the material form aggregate. Contact is the cause and condition for the manifestation of the feeling aggregate. Contact is the cause and condition for the manifestation of the perception aggregate. Contact is the cause and condition for the manifestation of the formations aggregate. Mentality materiality is the cause and condition for the manifestation of the consciousness aggregate. Venerable Sir, how does identity view come to be? Here Bhikkhu, an untaught, ordinary person who has no regard for the noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, who has no regard for true men and is unskilled and dis undisciplined in their dhamma, regards material form as self or self as possessed of material form, or material form as in self, or self as in material form, regards feelings as self, or self as possessed of feelings, or feelings as in self, or self as in feelings, regards perception as self, or self as possessed of perception, or perception as in self, or self as in perception, regards formations as self, or self as possessed of formations, or formations as in self, or self as in formations, regards consciousness as self, or self as possessed of consciousness, or consciousness as in self, or self as in consciousness. That is how identity view comes to be. But Venerable Sir, how does identity view not come to be? Here Bhikkhu, a well thought noble disciple who has regard for the noble ones and is skilled and disciplined in their Dhamma, who has regard for true men and is skilled and disciplined in their Dhamma, does not regard material form as self or self as possessed of material form, or material form as in self, or self as in material form, does not regard feeling as self, or self as possessed of feeling, or self as in self, or feeling as in self, or self as in feeling, does not regard perception as self, or self as possessed of perception, or perception as in self, or self as in perception, does not regard formations as self, or self as possessed of formations, or formations as in self, or self as in formations, does not regard consciousness as self, or self as possessed of consciousness, or consciousness as in self, or self as in consciousness. That is how Identity view does not come to be. What, Venerable Sir, is the gratification? What is the danger? And what is the escape in the case of material form? What is the gratification? What is the danger? And what is the, what is the escape in the case of feeling, in the case of perception, in the case of formations, in the case of consciousness? 
the pleasure and joy bhikkhu that arise in dependence on material form. This is the gratification in the case of material form. Material form is impermanent, suffering and subject to change. This is the danger in the case of material form. The removal of desire and lust, the abandonment of desire and lust for material form. This is the escape in the case of material form. The pleasure and joy that arise in dependence on feeling, in dependence on perception, in dependence on formations, in dependence on consciousness. This is the gratification. Uh, one second. This is the gratification, feeling, perception, formations, and consciousness are in permanent suffering and subject to change. This is the danger. The removal and the removal of desire and lust, the abandonment of desire and lust for feeling, for perception, for formations, and for consciousness. This is the escape. Venerable Sir, how does one know? How does one see? So that in regard to this body with its consciousness and all external signs, there is no eye-making, mind-making, and underlying tendency to conceit. Bhikkhu, any kind of material form, whatever, whether present or or whether past or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, one sees all material form as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Any kind of feeling whatsoever, any kind of perception whatsoever, any kind of formations whatsoever, any kind of consciousness whatsoever, one's, one sees these aggregates as they actually are with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. It is when one knows and sees thus that in regard to this body with its consciousness and all external signs, there is no eye-making, mind-making, or underlying tendency to conceit. Then in the mind of a certain bhikkhu, this thought arose. So it seems material form is not self. Feeling is not self. Perception is not self. Formations are not self. Consciousness is not self. What self then will actions done by the not-self effect. Then the Blessed One, knowing in his mind the thought in the mind of that bhikkhu, addressed the bhikkhus thus. It is possible, bhikkhus, that some misguided man here, obtuse and ignorant, with his mind dominated by craving, might think that he can outstrip the teacher's dispensation thus. So it seems that material form, feeling, perception, consciousness, and formations are not self. What self then will actions done by the not self affect? Now, because you have been trained by me through interrogation on various occasions in regard to various things. Because what do you think? Is material form permanent or impermanent? impermanent venerable sir is what is impermanent suffering or happiness suffering venerable sir is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be this to fit to be regarded thus this is mine this i am this is myself no venerable sir what do you think because is feeling perception formations consciousness are they permanent or impermanent, impermanent, venerable sir. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, venerable sir. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit
fit to be regarded thus. This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, venerable sir. Therefore, bhikkhus, any kind of material form whatsoever, whether past, future, or present, all material form should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Any kind of feeling, any kind of perception, any kind of formations, any kind of consciousness whatsoever, all should be seen as they actually are with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Seeing thus a well-taught noble disciple becomes disenchanted with material form, disenchanted with feeling, disenchanted with perception, disenchanted with formations, disenchanted with consciousness. Being disenchanted, he becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion, his mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge it is liberated. He understands birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. This is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Now, while this discourse was being spoken, through not clinging, the minds of 60 bhikkhus were liberated from the defilements. As one deepens their practice, both in meditation and in daily life, one will see with wisdom that the links of dependent origination are the flow which affect the five aggregates. So there is this link between the five aggregates and dependent origination in the sense that one can liken dependent origination to a river and the five aggregates as the riverbed. And it's through this boundaries within that, that the river of dependent origination flows. And as it flows, if it has clinging, if it has craving, if it has conceit rooted in any of the links starting from formations, these fetters will then tie into the five aggregates. So the five aggregates are likened to be the stationary aspect of how we experience things, whereas though they change in every moment and they are subject to change, the links of dependent origination also are continuously flowing. And through this continual flow, through this continual change and cycle of the links of dependent origination from arising and passing away, they have a effect on the five aggregates. If one were to start to look at each of the five aggregates with wisdom, one will see that to consider any of these five aggregates, starting with form, is to be in delusion when one takes them as self. In other words, when you look at form, you understand that the form that the Buddha is talking about is 
the material form of the four great elements, or as we mentioned in modern scientific terminology, the four states of matter, which continually have an effect on the body. The body is continuously changing, if it were not so. When one is born, one would not grow. The bones wouldn't fuse. The organs wouldn't grow. The organs wouldn't be changing. The cells in one's body wouldn't be changing, and so on and so forth. So as the Buddha says, if something is impermanent, should one consider it to be happy or creating happiness or creating suffering? In other words, if something is impermanent, should we consider it to be something that can provide us with long lasting happiness? And if one were to just watch and observe, one will see that no, there is no point to holding on to something that is impermanent to the point that it arises and passes away in a matter of moments. So likewise with feeling, our sensations, they arise and pass away dependent upon causes. And because they arise and pass away dependent on so many different causes and conditions in every given moment, you cannot consider feelings to be permanent. You cannot consider these sensory experiences to be permanent and therefore not worth holding on to. And then when you look at the perceptions that arise, the perceptions are conditioned by contact, as the Buddha says. When feeling arises, it is conjoined with perception and cognition or consciousness. And this perception is what is rooted in memory in other words, through learning and memory, which means that if a being for the first time were to see the color blue and they didn't know what color it was and they learned through their elders, through their parents or through their teachers or through society in general, that this color is the color blue. And so that concept of that color of blue then is ingrained in one's memory. And whenever one starts to see the color blue, there is the recognition aspect of the mind, which is rooted in that memory that arise through formations. And so these formations too arise from contact. When you have contact, these formations arise based on that contact to then activate a certain consciousness which then flows through mentality and materiality. And through that mentality, materiality is experienced and reckoned through the sensory experiences. And then the feeling that arises is then what is conjoined with the perception. So there is an interdependence an interlinking and a interconnection between feeling, perception and consciousness. Consciousness if one looks at the Pali word and the Sanskrit word is Vigyan or Vinyana. That means the consciousness that discerns, the consciousness that discriminates, and it is discriminating the different sensory experiences that one has. Therefore, this consciousness that arises is always tied through mentality and materiality to the sensory experiences that arise. There are these 12 types of consciousness. There is the consciousness that is tied to the eyes, to the ears, to the nose, to the tongue, to the skin, and to the mind. These are the consciousnesses that are tied to the six sense bases that are the internal six sense bases in that regard. And then the outer or the external six senses or the experiences, which are the consciousnesses that are tied to the visuals or the visual forms, to the auditory experiences, to the olfactory experiences through the nose, to the experience of taste in the tongue, through the experience of touch through the skin, 
and through the experience of thought and feeling through the mind. The, therefore, if the consciousness that arises are dependent upon these sensory experiences, which we already understand to be impermanent because they arise and pass away, dependent on other causes and conditions, particularly contact in any given moment, we cannot consider such consciousness to be, number one, impermanent, number two, undivided, which is to say that it is an independent, undivided, unchanging consciousness that is eternal. In every given moment, in every given second, there is up to two million arising and passing away of consciousnesses. So in that, you cannot consider there to be something that is long lasting happiness. Likewise with formations, likewise with perception, likewise with feelings, likewise with material form and the body. And therefore, you cannot consider any sense of self that can arise from these five aggregates or that any of the five aggregates that arise from a sense of self to be, in, to be permanent, to be satisfying and to be unchanging. There is no permanent self in any of these, including the links of dependent origination. Now, when you look at the five aggregates, let's take them one by one. You have, for example, we'll start with formations. These formation aggregates are the receptacle, if you will, of the flow of formations in every given moment. They are in that regard a repository of formations which are continually changing. Likewise, for the aggregates of consciousness, the aggregate of perception and of feeling, and of course, of the body or material form. So when you start to understand with deeper and deeper wisdom and insight, the links of dependent origination, and finally come to the realization after ignorance is destroyed, that the formations that flow through and then activate a consciousness and then create, then are rooted in this mentality materiality, make up the five aggregates. So in other words, the formations are a process which are then received through the aggregate of formations. There is the faculty of the ability to have the formations arise, and there is a process of the arising of formations. There is then within mentality and materiality, the faculty for consciousness to be rooted into and then experienced through the sixth sense base, which is rooted within the mentality materiality. There is then perception, the process of feeling and perception which is rooted within the faculties of feeling and perception within mentality. And then there is the process of contact, which is rooted in the mentality, uh, in the faculty of contact. So to simplify, within the mentality of materiality and of mentality materiality, you have these five faculties, which is feeling, perception, contact, intention, and attention. So the process of formations get rooted through consciousness into intention. The process of feeling and perception get rooted through the faculty of feeling and perception, which also include the sixth sense base themselves. And then you have the material form, which makes up the materiality of the mentality and materiality. So when there is an experience that arises, for example, if one sees the color blue, there are those formations that are rooted with the association of what that color is in the mental formations 
this then provides the consciousness to arise, which gets rooted through the mentality materiality that is through the faculties of mentality and through the form that is rooted in materiality and then is experienced at the process of contact through the sixth sense base, particularly through the eye or through the eyes. And then when that arises, there is the feeling, the process of feeling, which is actuated or activated through the faculty of feeling within the mentality of mentality materiality. That then gives rise to perception which is that recognition that this is the color blue. And that arises through the faculty of perception that is rooted in mentality. So when this happens, this all occurs within a moment, less than a moment. It's the firing of the neurons and the synapses in which the formations arise and then Within microseconds, there is a recognition that this is the color blue. And then in more complex and complicated aspects of reality in which one is not only, for example, watching a movie where there are moving pixels and colors and images, but listening to auditory experiences and perhaps even then feeling, if one pays attention to the air conditioned room or whatever it might be. So. There is in any given moment, a myriad of consciousnesses that are arising, a myriad of feelings and perception that are arising. And what arises thereafter is based on one's observation, effective observation or right mindfulness. If with mindfulness one understands that whatever arises, past, present, or future, internal or external, subtle or gross, is not me, not mine, not myself, and therefore will not personalize the experience that is arising and being felt, and therefore will not crave more of it, or feel uncomfortable and try to detract from it through aversion, if one with wisdom and mindfulness sees this, craving will not arise. And therefore, the clinging that is attributed to the five aggregates affected by clinging, which is that desire and lust and even aversion that arises from the experience of the five aggregates, will be let go of, will be abandoned, and will be seen through with wisdom. The more one does this, the more one conditions one's mind in daily practice, in daily life. Now, within the meditation, these five aggregates are present. But as one deepens the practice and enters into higher jhanas, the experience of these aggregates starts to become subtler and subtler until at the point between nothingness and neither perception nor non-perception, they are not felt and experienced. Though they are present, they are not tended to with one's attention, with mind's attention. When you come upon the seventh jhana of nothingness, this is what happens. You first start to see the different consciousness experiences tied to a particular sense or maybe even multiple senses. And then you start to look at the gaps in between each arising and passing away and you start to deepen your practice to the point that you only tend towards that gap. And as that gap widens, you then sink into that nothingness and there is the perception of nothingness. There's the perception of being in the seventh jhan of nothingness and then there is also the contact of having that perception of nothingness, the feeling of being in that nothingness, and the consciousness that arises from seeing that nothingness. However, since one is so deeply rooted in the higher jhanas, while being there with effective collectedness, with right collectedness, 
there is very little contact in the way of the physical form. Now the experiences of the external reality in relation to the physical senses and form are no longer perceivable or very rarely perceivable, if at all. But generally speaking, within the experience of nothingness, you have these internal experiences of the four aggregates discounting the material form. Now, how does one enter then neither perception or non-perception? You, your mind essentially starts to quiet down to the point that as it's observing the radiating of the equanimity with the small intention that pushes it out and just merely and only observing, and then at a certain point, the mind becomes so quiet that then you take this mind as the object. Now here is what one must understand. In taking the tranquil mind as an object, don't allow the projection of a sense of self in that mind. In doing so, in allowing the mind to be a not-self aspect. In other words, seeing that mind as another effect of a series of causes and conditions, and therefore not to be taken as self, and therefore merely observed, one drops and abandons any kind of projection that can create subtle craving, subtle conceit, and subtle ignorance related to the observing of that mind. Once this happens, there is a disenchantment and dispassion that arises in which the concepts that might arise rooted from that mind no longer interest that mind. And so one is automatically abandoning and letting go through an automated six hour process since mind has become so deep to that point that the intention of just the six hour process automates it. One starts to disregard in that sense one starts to become disenchanted with all perception that might arise and any formations that might arise. And so there is a shift, a shift that can be felt in some sense of a sinking or looking away in some sense from the mind that is tranquil, the luminous, radiant, bright, tranquil mind that one has taken as an object, but as an impersonal object. Once that disenchantment arises from that, one then goes into neither perception nor non-perception. And at this point, there might arise very subtle formations, very subtle per perceptions, and there might be disconnected thoughts. What one must do is allow the mind to continually let go of them and remember when required to balance the enlightenment factors. There comes a point where there is such stillness at that point that no formations or very, very, very subtle formations arise few and far in between their arising and passing away and the observing of the stillness that one just merely intends the relaxing of that, merely intends the letting go of that without paying attention to it and staying with that stillness. At a certain point, disregarding all things that might arise in such a mind where there is that stillness, one comes to a point which is in some of the suttas described as signless collectedness. Here, one disregards all signs that arise because one becomes disenchanted with all signs and dispassionate for all signs because one has understood that everything that arises and passes away is impermanent and therefore not worth holding on to and disregards them or disregards and 
no longer projects any sense of self towards any kind of formation that arises. And then in the stillness, in disregarding all signs, there is that signless collectedness, that state of signlessness, which then is the border point, the border line between the eighth jhana of neither perception or non-perception and the total cessation of perception and feeling. When one sees that even the stillness should be taken as not self and disregard even the stillness and any concepts of Nibbana that might arise or any concepts of stillness that might arise and let's go of even that one has let go of even the most subtlest levels of formation, perception, feeling and consciousness and one then enters into the cessation of perception and feeling and consciousness. And then when one emerges from it, experiences that Nibbana. So there is then that emphasis in every sutta, almost every sutta, in some way or another of letting go and of not grasping. So not even grasping to that border point of that signless, con uh, that signless collectedness, allowing the mind to let go even of that and understanding that even this is fabricated, even this is made up of formations. And therefore in the letting go, you are deconditioning the mind of any concepts. You are unconditioning it and therefore the unconditioning of it, the unforming of it, the unbirthing of it, the uncreating of it, then one lets completely go of that in that process, abandons all grasping and enters into Nibbana. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisitions of all kinds of happiness. May being inhabiting space and earth Devas and Nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.